my students, and welcome back to another lecture for CORE 202. So today, we are going to talk about Max Weber and his very famous book, The Protestant Ethic and the Spirit of Capitalism. So let's get started, like we always do, by talking about the author. So, here he is, Carl Emil Maximilian Weber. Quite a name, right? So he lived basically in the latter part of the 1800s and on into the early 1900s. And he was born in Prussia, which didn't stay Prussia for very long. It became the German Empire, and then it became the Weimar Republic, and now it's Germany, but that part's not important. So Weber was really an interesting dude because he had a lot of careers. He was raised by his very strict Calvinist mother, which will become important later, um, and his father, who was a lawyer, so he had an excellent education. So he went to law school and began practicing as a lawyer, and after that he followed a pretty complex career path. So basically, he was practicing as a lawyer, that was going pretty well. He started teaching law classes, so he was a professor of law for a little while. While he was doing that, he started noticing the immigrant problem. There's always an immigrant problem. And so he started looking into what was happening there, which made him become a government consultant in regard to the immigrants. While he was a government consultant, he realized that the problems were possibly fixable at the political level, so he became a politician. But he hated other politicians, so he stopped being a politician and became a social scientist, because he thought perhaps the best way to solve the immigrant problem was to look at it from a social point of view. He was one of the very first sociologists, really, and often one of the first professors of sociology, especially in Heidelberg. So then, he didn't really like teaching that much, so he became an editor of uh, social journals, basically, early sociology journals. Then the war happened, so he became an army officer, mostly in charge of like supplies and that sort of thing. Then he decided that he didn't like working for anybody at all, so he became a private scholar, although there was some mental illness issues here, we'll talk about that later. And finally, he went back to being a sociology professor. That's the kind of career most of us can only hope for, right? So I wanted to tell you a few other things about Weber that I think were kind of central to his process. So one thing that you should know is that he went to the World's Fair when it was here in America in St. Louis in 1904. And it was kind of a groundbreaking World's Fair. There was all sorts of stuff there that we had never seen before. Uh, for instance, the recently invented x-ray machine. Um, there were also babies in incubators, because incubators had just been invented. So they like put them on display. You could go look at them. There were electric streetcars, personal automobiles, and because society was not particularly advanced at that time, also actual live humans on display. But Weber found it very inspiring, and when he came home he immediately wrote about the capitalist ethic, so maybe it worked. It's also important to note that when he did get married, which he did as an adult later on, and it was probably a marriage of convenience, he married one of his slightly distant cousins, Marianne Schnitger. And she was super cool. Um, she was not particularly well educated because they didn't educate women very much at the time, but she was very smart and published a lot and hosted these intellectual salons that he got the credit for. Uh, she did a lot of the organization of his writing. And after his death, she basically hid his mental illnesses, including depression, from the Nazis because they thought that mental illness was a sign of weakness. And she put together all of his papers and published all of his unpublished work. So she basically propped him up and supported him throughout his life, while also writing and publishing a lot of her own pieces. So she was pretty cool. I also wanted to tell you about his opinion of politicians, because I thought this was particularly funny. So while he was working as a politician, he discovered that he basically hated all the other people who were politicians. And this is what he said about them. In nine out of ten cases, they are windbags, puffed up with hot air about themselves. They are not in touch with reality, and they do not feel the burden they need to shoulder. They just intoxicate themselves with romantic sensations." Mm, a little familiar. So today in Nothing New Under the Sun, politicians. So here is the piece we're going to discuss today, The Protestant Ethic and the Spirit of Capitalism. So the point of this piece is basically to explain why capitalism was taking off as hard as it was. And Weber's argument was that it was directly tied to religion, which was a brand new argument. So this was kind of the first work that came out that tried to make those two connections, especially while it was happening in real time. And it came out in 1905, and it is considered one of the great works of sociology. So if you do go into sociology, you'll definitely read more Weber, but you'll definitely read this piece of Weber. So before we get too into kind of what's going on in this book, I wanted to back up and explain a little bit about religion. So buckle up. 
So the first thing we'll talk about is what Protestantism even is. So basically, Protestants are Christians, but they're very specifically separate from Catholics. Um, basically, they separated from the Catholic Church because of all of the bad things that the Catholic Church was doing. I'm sure you're familiar. But the thing that I'd like to talk about in regard to Protestants are their three fundamental beliefs. And these are the things that really set them apart from Catholicism. So first, sola scriptura. And that means that you depend on the scripture alone. That basically the priest can't just make things up. Everything you need to know is in the Bible. The second, sola fide, faith alone. So this means that you don't need to, for instance, pay the priest to get into heaven. You would get into heaven based on your faith alone. And the final part is called universal priesthood. And what that means is that every member of the church should be able to read the Bible and should be able to essentially preach. So this is very important because this does separate them from the practices of the Catholic Church at the time. Basically, they wanted to get away from the monetization of religion. So in this map of the world, you can see where Protestants are most likely to be. So of course, they're largely gathered in America, a lot of them in Brazil, and of course, a lot of them in Western Europe where they started in the first place. In this graph, you can see how likely Americans are to be Protestant. One thing you'll notice is that people are less likely to be religious in general, which we will talk about. But in 2003, at least 50% uh, of people who identified as religious were Protestant, whereas in 2017, only about 36%. But you can still see that there are typically more Protestants than there are Catholics. The final thing that I wanted to talk about in regard to religion was Calvinism. So Weber's mother was a Calvinist, and that's important because Calvinists were very, very strict in their ideas about what God wanted and how God showed favor to people. Essentially, they were Protestant, but their twist was predestination. So Calvinists believe that God has already picked who will be successful and who will go to heaven and who are the best people before they're even born. So you are still obligated to try to live up to the ideals that would make you the best possible Christian, but there's no way of really knowing if you are the kind of person who will go to hell or go to heaven. So predestination was really important to them. But they did also believe that God favored those who were going to go to heaven anyway. So you could prove, kind of, that you were a good Christian by being rich or by being successful, because that meant that God had favored you. It's a little convoluted, but it's important to remember this because this kind of idea of wealth being associated with goodness will show up again in this book. So now we come to the author's introduction. So I assign this part because this is where he explains his idea of capitalism. But on the way, he says a bunch of stuff that isn't useful at all, so we'll cover that part fast. So the first thing to know is that he uses these two words a lot that we don't use much anymore, which is Occidental and Oriental. So basically at the time, especially for Western Europeans, the entire globe was divided into East and West, which is of course is weird because it was a sphere, but whatever. Um, basically it started at Eastern Europe. So all of Western Europe and eventually North America was the West. And everything East of that, basically until the Pacific Ocean, was the East. So when he talks about the Occident, he's talking about Western Europe, pretty much. And when he talks about the Orient, he's talking about mostly China, but it's kind of hard to tell. So one of the things that he does in the very beginning of this introduction is he starts to talk about how there have been advanced cultures before. And specifically, there had been advanced Oriental cultures. He talks a lot about how good their art was, and then he proceeds to put down everything else they did. So again, a pretty profound misunderstanding of anthropology. But what he's trying to say here is that their societies hadn't quite been organized in a way that would promote capitalism. And that instead, the weird things that were going on in the West were organized in a way that would promote capitalism. So what he's really saying is that the cultural differences were what allowed capitalism to arise and become so strong. So one of the things that's really important once he starts to explain what capitalism even is is that the definition that he uses is kind of different from the definition that we would think of now. So he first says that the idea of capitalism is not unlimited profit, not unlimited gain. The impulse to acquisition, pursuit of gain, of money, of the greatest possible amount of money, has in itself nothing to do with capitalism. Unlimited greed for gain is not in the least identical with capitalism, and still less in its spirit. Again, this might sound unfamiliar to us, because that's kind of the way we practice capitalism now. But this is his definition. 
we will define a capitalistic economic action as one which rests on the expectation of profit by the utilization of opportunities for exchange. That is, on formal, peaceful chances of profit. So basically he's saying that capitalism isn't stealing. Capitalism isn't just grab, grab, grab. Capitalism is making careful choices and careful calculations and careful deductions to end up with profit. So he's trying to draw a line, essentially, between just like stealing and capitalism. He goes on to say that the most important thing about capitalism is balance. Everything is done in terms of balances. At the beginning of the enterprise, an initial balance. Before every individual decision, a calculation to ascertain its probable profitableness. And at the end, a final balance to ascertain how much profit has been made. So his idea here is that capitalism is based very carefully on calculation. That it's based on knowing some you know, calculation at the front, some calculation in the middle, and some calculation at the end. So it's not just grab, grab, grab. It's more like carefully keeping notes about what's happening. So now he begins to explain the social factors that contributed to the rise of capitalism. And the thing that's really important to remember here is rational industrial organization. So basically it's rational because it doesn't depend on feelings, it depends on logic. It's industrial because we're leaving the house and we're making things on a huge scale on machines. And it's organization because we're starting to keep track of all of the numbers, going in, going out, all the numbers. So this was kind of a different way of doing business. Obviously, we'd never made anything on this scale before, but it was also just a separate social way of doing business than we had seen before. So he talks about these two things that kind of allowed this idea of how we should do business to emerge. And one was the separation of business from the household. So no more farmers, no more artisans making things at home, not even living above the bakery. We're talking about house being separate from work leave to go to work. The second thing was rational bookkeeping. So it's not that bookkeeping didn't exist, but this kind of capitalistic organization required really detailed bookkeeping. And that was the kind of thing that was only just starting to become popular in Western culture. So the next thing that was just vital for any of this to happen was, of course, the Industrial Revolution. So this is how he describes it. Now, the peculiar modern Western form of capitalism has been, at first sight, strongly influenced by the development of technical possibilities. So essentially, we wouldn't even have developed capitalism if we hadn't first developed the idea of producing so many things at once. So we couldn't have had capitalism until we had so many machines that we were making so many things that we needed to employ so many people, so we created all these jobs. So the idea of making things on this kind of scale was vital to the idea of capitalism. The next thing is the idea of free labor. So this doesn't mean that the labor is free. This means that the laborers are free to choose. So instead of like being born into serfdom or being born into literal slavery, you were born and allowed to choose what job you did. So free labor was the idea that you had choices and you chose this. He says that basically it was the rise of economic individualism, that as an individual person, you chose work instead of like, oh, my family has always been barrel makers or something like that. So it's kind of ironic because people talk a lot about how it isn't free at all because we just went some people from literal chains to figurative chains. But the thing that he's talking about here is the idea that you did have choices and you did choose the job you chose. The other thing, was that other social changes had happened that made everybody more comfortable with this kind of organization. Among those of undoubted importance are the rational structures of law and administration. For modern rational capitalism has need not only of the technical means of production, but of a calculable legal system and of administration in, in terms of formal rules. So this like level of formality was really crucial everything needed to get more formal, more organized, more rational. So not just work, but also the law. The one thing that he also notices about this is that you can't just convince people to switch from one like sort of lifestyle to another or one way of thinking to another. So he noticed that basically some gradual changes had already been in place. 
For though the development of economic rationalism is partly dependent on rational technique and law, it is at the same time determined by the ability and disposition of men to adopt certain types of practical rational conduct. So he thinks that only certain people can adopt this rational practical conduct, which is going to be important later because it's, spoiler alert, white men. But the idea that he's trying to express here is that it takes a certain kind of person to want to live this way and to want to work this way. He contrasts this with how people are usually guided by religion. The magical and religious forces and the ethical ideas of duty based upon them have in the past always been among the most important formative influences on conduct. So basically he's saying that we used to make all of our decisions based on religion, and now we are making our decisions based on this new sort of formal logical thing. And his question is whether those two things are combined. So this brings us to chapter one, religious affiliation and social stratification. Again, his idea here is that he's gonna to try to combine these two things. So. He starts the way that all sociology starts, by noticing something weird and wanting to know what's going on there. Business leaders and owners of capital, as well as the higher grades of skilled labor, and even more, the higher technically and commercially trained personnel of modern enterprises, are overwhelmingly Protestant. So basically, he kind of looked around and he was like, hmm, it seems to me that the people who are at the top of these organizations are all Protestant instead of being Catholic. Why? That's his guiding research question. He wants to know why this might happen. So Weber's first thought is that it might have something to do with geographic location. So he noticed that basically the parts of Western Europe that became Protestant were already kind of wealthy. A number of those sections of the old empire, which were most highly developed economically, went over to Protestantism in the 16th century. The results of that circumstance favor the Protestants, even today, in their struggle for economic existence. So for reference, here's another map. This is basically the parts of Western Europe um, after the Protestant Reformation. So you can see that the green parts are Catholic, the yellow parts are Lutheran, the blue parts are Calvinist, and the only uh, pink part there is Anglican. So his argument here is that perhaps the parts like the Calvinist parts and the Lutheran parts were already wealthy, and so when they transferred over to Protestantism, that wealth went with them. So next he kind of ties that into this idea of inherited wealth. Participation in the above economic functions usually involves some previous ownership of capital, and generally an expensive education, often both. This is something we've talked about a little bit, the idea that wealth and education are very often correlated. There are today largely dependent on the possession of inherited wealth, or at least on a certain degree of material well-being. So again, it could be that they were located in a place that became Protestant, and it's not the idea of Protestantism at all. A pretty interesting idea. He also explores the idea that it might have to do with the kind of education that they got. Catholics prefer the sort of training which the humanistic gymnasium affords. That is one reason why so few Catholics are engaged in capitalistic enterprise. So basically, there's two kinds of education. We talked about this. The humanistic education he's talking about is us, liberal arts. The other kind of education is much more focused on career. So this is kind of how it looks in Germany. There's the gymnasium, which is like the highest level of secondary education. It can be kind of a combination of high school and college. So the real gymnasium prepares you for university. It'd be sort of like a college prep or like international baccalaureate. The Realschule is sort of a mix of like vocational training and university training. And the Hauptschule is vocational training. So it's kind of like the difference that often we see in American high schools. You can sort of go the vocational path or the college path or somewhere in the middle, but it's a lot more pronounced in Germany, especially at this point in history, you usually had to choose when you were like 11. So there were vastly different educational paths, and he thinks that might be why some people went in one direction and some people in another direction, because basically the Catholics favor the liberal arts and the Protestants favor a more vocational approach. This is kind of how he summed that up. The Catholics show a stronger propensity to remain in their crafts, 
whereas the Protestants are attracted to a larger extent into the factories in order to fill the upper ranks of skilled labor and administrative positions. So he's essentially saying that the kind of people who are Catholics develop this idea that they should stay with their craft, whereas the kind of people who are Protestants develop the idea that they belong at the top and they belong in leadership positions. And they might have learned this in school. Next, he notes that there might also be a familial connection, that maybe people are choosing these different jobs based on what their families already do. The explanation of these cases is undoubtedly that of the mental and spiritual peculiarities acquired from the environment. Here, the type of education favored by the religious atmosphere of the home community and the parental home have determined the choice of occupation and through it, the professional career. So maybe you go into a career because that's what you saw the rest of your family do. Finally, he directly addresses the religious correlation. Thus, the principal explanation of this difference must be sought in the permanent intrinsic character of their religious beliefs. And not only, their temporary external historico-political situations. So now he's kind of saying, well, maybe all of the other stuff we looked at, education and family and location, maybe all of that was really just tied into religion. It will be our task to investigate these religions with a view to finding out what peculiarities they have or have had, which might have resulted in the behavior we have described. So basically he's saying that he rejects location, he rejects education, he rejects family, and he's settling on religion. So now he has to kind of work through whether he might be wrong. This part is kind of funny. So basically he says, on superficial analysis and on the basis of certain current impressions, one might be tempted to express the difference by saying that the greater otherworldliness of Catholicism, the ascetic character of its highest ideals, must have brought up its adherence to a greater indifference toward the good things of the world. A complicated piece of language, but basically he's saying, maybe the Catholics believe that they shouldn't try to be rich, that they have this sort of like otherworldly purpose, and so they don't care about life on earth, they care about life after earth. And maybe that's why they're not pursuing different jobs. But then he's like, mm, maybe not, because he noticed that he'd met some French Calvinists who live very otherworldly lives and some German Catholics who like more earthly pleasures. So basically he thinks of this thing and then he rejects it based on anecdotal evidence, which is not how we do science, but still close enough. Then he goes into this part that is just like, okay, waver. So he talks about a lot of different Protestant sects that have strong economic tendencies. So basically he's saying, I have some proof. Here are some German Calvinists and some American Quakers and some Prussian men, et cetera, et cetera. So basically he's saying, all right, I have this anecdotal evidence, but I also have this other evidence. And I think this is probably a little bit stronger. So he sort of wraps up by saying that this is his goal for the project. If any, interrelationship between certain expressions of the old Protestant spirit and modern capitalistic culture is to be found, we must attempt to find it, for better or worse, not in its alleged more or less materialistic, or at least anti-ascetic joy of living, but in its purely religious characteristics. Rephrased quite eloquently as, are capitalists also Protestant, or what? An amazing research question. So I thought you might be curious about whether this is still true. One of the problems with CORE that we often hear about is that these readings are so old and it feels like they don't really have a lot of relevance to the modern world. So I wanted to talk just for a minute about the presence of religion and capitalism still happening in America. So the first thing to address is that religiosity is on the decline. Americans are increasingly less and less religious. So for instance, in this graph, we're tracking the decline of church membership from 1994 to 2014. And you can see that it has a little bit of up and down, but by and large, it goes from about 70% to about 60%. So there is a steady decline in the amount of people who consider themselves religious. That has been true kind of all along, but interestingly, Protestantism is dropping faster than Catholicism. In this graph, you can see that basically they're tracking the same thing, uh, who identifies as which specific subset of religious from 2007 to 2019. And you'll notice that the Protestants tend to drop the fastest. 
the Catholics are dropping, but going from 24 to 20 is not so bad, and we're pretty sure that's just because the old Catholics are passing on. Uh, but you'll notice that there's a rise in people who are not religious. The only thing that is inclining uh, is nothing in particular or agnostic. Atheist tends to stay kind of at the bottom. So basically one of the big changes happening in America over the last couple decades is that less people are becoming you know, actively religious and more people are beginning to question religion or they're beginning to practice religion but outside of the church. They're taking it as sort of a more personal, a more spiritual approach. So it is important to know that religion has an impact, but first of all, it is on the decline. The next thing to note is that there is still a correlation between what specific religion you practice and wealth. So in this graph, uh, we're looking at income ranking by religious group, and this is from 2000. We don't have good 2020 data because we kind of had to cancel the census, but this is still pretty much true. So at the very top, you'll notice the Jewish people, followed closely by the Unitarians and the Episcopalians. So basically, the Jews have most of the wealth, uh, which continues to be true because they're very good at investing, but they're followed by the Protestants. So we see Unitarians, Episcopalians, Presbyterians, Lutherans, Methodists, etc., etc. Catholics are there sort of in the middle at about 47,000 a year. And you'll notice that the more evangelical religions do tend to make less money. So at the very bottom, you'll see Church of God, for instance, or Seventh-day Adventist or Pentecostals, but Jehovah's Witnesses tend to have the least wealth of all. Hindus, you'll notice, are kind of at the top, also interesting. Here's another way of thinking about it. In this graph, it's breaking down how many people are in which category, which can be a more helpful way of thinking about it. So in terms of an average, you're, you don't know how, like if one person is throwing the whole thing off, but with this kind of graph, you have a good idea of where people are in the scale. So again, the information doesn't change. Um, you'll notice that it's broken down into less than 30,000, 30 to 50, 50 to 100, and more than 100. So the same sort of ranking shows up here, although Hindus did climb the chart. But you'll notice that very few Jewish people, for instance, are in poverty. Whereas if we look at the Jehovah's Witnesses and the National Baptist Convention, almost half of them are in poverty. So there is still, even now, a direct correlation to what religion you practice and your wealth. And they're not necessarily directly in related, like tithing does come into it, but more likely other things come into it. Inherited wealth, education, lifestyle. So that's important to remember, that there is still this difference. One reason we might have this difference, of course, is education. So this graph is kind of amazing, but basically, on the y-axis, we're measuring the percentage of households with an income above 75000 a year. So that's pretty wealthy. On the x-axis, we're measuring, uh, you know, what religion they are. So you'll notice that, for instance, Hindus have a much higher percent of college graduates and a much, a much higher likelihood of being college educated, followed, of course, by the Reform and the Conservative Jews, the Anglicans and Episcopalians, Unitarians. Again, this is consistent with the other things that we saw. Whereas, once again, the Jehovah's Witnesses are not only more likely to be impoverished, they're more likely to not have a college education. Education and wealth always correlate, but now we're also seeing that wealth and religion also correlate, which means that education and religion are also correlated, but we'll get there later. This is, yet again, another way to think about this. But in this graph, it's a scatter plot which means that basically we place things on the X and Y axis, and then we look for the closest little clumps so that we can draw a line between them. So essentially you're looking for a pattern that would indicate what's going on here. So in this scatter plot, we're looking at which nations are poorer measured against which nations are the most religious. So essentially on the Y axis, we're measuring the percent of people who say religion is important. On the X axis, we're measuring GDP. So again, what you'll see is that the poorest nations tend to also be the most religious, whereas the richest nations tend to be the least religious. This makes sense, again, because we've seen this correlation. However, you'll notice that America is just hanging out over here all by itself like a weirdo.
American religion is a whole weird thing that's a little bit separate from the rest of the world's you know, practice of religion. So I wanted to draw your attention to the idea that worldwide there is also a correlation between uh, religion and wealth, even though in America it's a little bit weird. The final thing that I wanted to show you are some maps, because sometimes this is even easier to picture. So in this map, we're looking at which counties have the highest representation of which specific religions. So in this one, you'll notice, for instance, that religions tend to be clumped together. So the people who are religious adherents tend to live near one another. They tend to pass that religion on to their children. They tend to have churches that are you know, exclusively very local. This makes sense that people who practice the same religion are likely to live really close to one another. But you'll also notice that there are certain patterns that are emerging here. For instance, the light blue part is where the Mormons are. No surprise, Utah. The orange is where the African-American Protestants are. No surprise, the South. And the non-Hispanic white evangelical Protestants tend to be gathered here in the Southeast. No surprise, the Bible Belt. I think it's also interesting that so many of the mainline Protestants, the uh, Lutherans actually, are gathered up here in the Midwest, and that's because those people immigrated there and then just never left. One thing that's important though, is that in this map, we are also looking at counties broken down in each state, but here we're measuring poverty. So here, the darkest purple indicates that there are the most people likely to be impoverished, up to 50%, and the lightest white indicates that there are the least people likely to be impoverished, up to 11%. And again, you'll notice patterns. Certain parts of the country are just less wealthy than other parts of the country. The thing that I want to draw your attention to, though, is both of these maps side by side. And I couldn't figure out how to flick back and forth between them in the video, so I just shrunk them and put them on the same slide, sorry. But here we go. Do you see the pattern? Basically, the places where, for instance, African-American Protestantism is practiced are also the most impoverished. The places where evangelical uh, people tend to live, also the most impoverished. The places where Hispanic Catholics tend to live, also the most impoverished. The places where Episcopalians and Jews and Unitarians tend to live, the most wealthy. So even in modern America, there is still a definitive correlation between religion and wealth and, of course, place, but that might be related as well. So basically, Weber was onto something. This idea that how much money you have might be in some way related to what religion you have is real. What we'll talk about next week is why that might be, because it doesn't seem to make sense on the surface. So hopefully you got through this part okay. Let me know if you have any questions, and I'll see you soon.